Hey guys, Jared Wesley here of Live Traders, and it is that time of the week. It's lecture time, and this week's topic, guys, is who are you as a trader? You guys all think you're something you're not for the most part, and you're like, yeah, I think you've done a lecture on this topic. I've done a lecture on a similar topic, but today I've completely changed it up. There's only maybe one or two slides that are the same out of the 20 slides we're gonna go through, so it's pretty much a brand new lecture. I encourage you guys um, to watch it because I think it's gonna be a very eye-opening experience for you guys. You have people out there saying, oh, I wanna make 200 grand a year as a trader, but you have a $2,000 account. Oh, Jared, I wanna hit these big three R targets, but you're the most jittery, impatient person in the world. Oh, Jared, I have a job to go to you know, in one hour, but I wanna manage on 15 minute pivots. Well, that's not gonna work. So we're gonna talk about all of those topics today. Uh, we're gonna look at some charts as well, um, but basically this lecture about how to make you a better trader by showing you how to be a more objective person. We need to rid ourselves of the subjectivity and bring in the objectivity. It's gonna take a little bit of experience, a little bit of practice, but it's worth it. It's well worth it, all right? Great lecture. If you like these lectures, click that like button, smash, hammer that subscribe button. I'm Jared Wesley of Live Traders. Let's get to it. This week's lecture topic is, who are you as a trader? Uh, a lot of people think they are something they are not. Um, and that's just a general, I guess, uh, subjectivity we all have. But at the same time, who you are outside in the outside world uh, is not necessarily who you are as a trader. You guys hear me say it all the time. It's not a new analogy, but just because you can wait two hours for a ride in Disney World doesn't make you a patient person as a trader. It might make you a patient person because you can wait 45 minutes for that silly stuff cup of Starbucks. Um, but as a trader, could be completely and totally and utterly different. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today, um, who you are, what's required to be successful, um, and really going to ask you some questions about whether or not you are this or you are that, what you think you are versus what you really are. And the only way to know that, obviously, is to go out into the arena. You can think you're something, but till you're actually in the arena, you know what I mean? Like the Mike Tyson statement, everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Well, that's what trading is. When the market punches you in the mouth for the first time, you're going to realize, ooh, maybe, just maybe, I'm not the person I thought I was. Uh, does this mean that your hopes and dreams are crashed and diminished and crushed and you can never be a great trader? Not at all. It doesn't mean that at all. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about today. Just because you are wrong about who you are doesn't mean that that's the end of your trading career. Um, so let's dig on in and, um, and talk about this topic. Why most people fail. Trading is about the search for truth, okay? Objective, personal truth. Rid yourself of subjective bias. Find objective truth. You see, the last two parts of that are the problem, right? Subjective bias is a very difficult thing to overcome because sometimes, and I hate using this word because it's a popular catchword, it's unconscious bias. Sometimes it's just unconscious bias. You don't even realize you have it. But in trading, you will learn you have it if you track your trades because your tracking spreadsheet will show you what you're actually doing. And this is where I also tell traders all the time, video record yourself. Take OBS, Open Broadcast System, it's free. Download it and record yourself. Go buy a cheap microphone, a little Logitech camera and record yourself. Then there is no subjectivity. It's the objective truth. The person on the other side of that camera is you, okay? And you are saying and doing those things. But trading is really about the search for truth. Search for personal truth. Objective personal truth. And that's the problem, the objective part. Most people just aren't objective, okay? So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about some of the biases that you guys may or may not have and some of the things that you think about your own trading. Like here's, here's a good one, for example. And I know I harp on them all the time, but I feel like I can do this. Um, someone once said in the chat room, oh, it's an odd number, so that's the high of the day. If it's an even number, it can't be the high or the low of the day. That's not an objective truth. 
you need to tell me over the next 3,000 trades every day, at least for at least a six month or 12 month period, every day, check the high and low of the day for all 6,000 or 3,000 of those trades every day. And then you can come back after you have 100,000 examples, literally, and then you can tell me it's an objective truth. Otherwise, it's just subjective. Tuesdays are bad. Well, that's subjective unless you have the data over years, not months, because there's not that many Tuesdays in three months. You need to tell me that that's an objective truth. Do you see where I'm going with all this, guys? Biases that you don't think you have, you have, right? You look at the market a certain way and the market's just not that way because, oh, you had two losing trades beforehand, so now you're a little bit subjective on a trade that's crap, but you think it's good because you lost on the first two trades. So today we're gonna talk a lot about that. And here's kind of the first one, right? What do traders really do? What do we really do? Do we sit in our pajamas? Well, some people might. Do we gamble like casino, you know, people at a casino? Are we like Gordon Gecko? None of these things are what serious traders do, none. Serious traders don't trade from their pajamas. Serious traders don't gamble. Serious traders, at least as traders, aren't stealing information, right? We, don't, we aren't any of these things. All right, if you're being objective about it. Now, the world may see us this way, and sometimes you might see yourself as Gordon Gecko, but you're nothing like what he's doing, right? Some of you probably look like this on the right-hand side, right? Some of you probably are gambling, and I guarantee a 100% chance some of you listening are still in your pajamas, and you might even still be in bed. But you're not serious if you're doing any one of those three things, okay? You're not serious if you're doing any one of those three things. So, you guys have seen this slide, all right? You've seen this slide from Professional Trading Strategies. What type of trader do you want to be? It's a great question. But when you answer the question, you have to understand what it takes to be that trader. Does that make sense? Like, there's a lot of different types of traders out there. Right? There's a lot of different ways to make money in this business. But if you want to be a certain type of trader, there's considerations that need to be made. Personality traits, time constraints, capital constraints, intangibles. We're all a little bit different. Intangibles are something you might be good at and someone else might not be. Someone might be a very patient person. They might be a very jittery person. They might be a very angry person. They might be a very positive person. They might be a calm, easygoing person. They might be you know, ADHD. Okay, might have the attention span of a net. I don't know, but you do. And this is where the objectivity is paramount because if you're lying to yourself, you're gonna lie to yourself about who you are and that's gonna change what type of trader you can be, right? So some people will come in and say, well, I wanna be a trader that trades two hours a day and manages on 15 minute pivots. Well, what might be possibly be an issue with that? I want to trade two hours a day. That's the time constraint, okay? I want to manage on 15-minute pivots. What, what might be an issue with that, guys? Talk to me. What might be an issue in that scenario? And we haven't even gone deep yet. This is just surface. What might be an issue? Talk to me. I want to trade two hours a day and I want to manage on 15 minute pivots. Exactly, Ryan. Two hours is not probably enough for 15 minute bars, right? Jacob side of rice, Rouge, that could be very difficult. Sure, for some trades that's going to work, but for a good number, a large portion, call it 50% of your trades, two hours isn't enough. I mean, Let's, let's talk realistic here. Let's say you want to take buy setups. Well, you're probably looking at at least five or six bars, correct? Three bars up, two or three bars back, five or six bars, 15 minutes. You're already at an hour and a half before you've even entered the trade. <laughs> you're already at an hour and a half before you've ever entered the trade. Hasn't even pivoted yet on your management, and you're already an hour, hour and a half into the day. So that just doesn't jive with what you want to be, 
with the type of trader you want to be. It may jive with your personality, 15 minute pivots. It may meet your capital restraints and intents, but it doesn't meet your time constraints. If you have to, somewhere else to be or you have to go after two hours, then you simply cannot use that type of approach. Okay, let's go back to the drawing board, be objective again and figure out what we need to do to sort out that two hour time constraint that I have. And then I can work backwards from there. All right, maybe five minute charts, maybe all or nothing. Why, why all or nothing? Well, maybe I can still use 15 minute charts, but instead of pivots, I can use all or nothing because I can set a bracket order and leave. Literally set it to sell at the end of the day. Okay, now I've overcome one of the issues, right? So you need to think about these considerations when you're a trader. Let's be honest, guys. Come on. Let's just talk like adults. Did any of you actually do this when you started trading? I'm raising my hand right now. I didn't. I didn't. Did you think I looked at, oh, wow, this type of management with this uh, time frame wouldn't really meet this constraint I have before I have to go back to work and, oh, yeah, I'm super jittery, but 15-minute pivots, they'll work. I didn't do any of this crap. None of it. So this is why I'm you know, so strong about it with you guys so that you can at least shed some light on things that maybe are holding you back from being more successful. And I'm not just talking about management. I'm talking about your whole approach to trading, right? Capital restraints, example. I want to average uh, hypothetical. I want to average seven trades a day. Okay. Well, you might think, for example, seven trades a day on $5 risk. No problem. Money is not a problem. But what happens when you get to $100 risk or $200 risk or $300 or whatever the number is, and you want to average seven trades a day? You might have a problem. You might have a buying power problem, especially if those seven trades are large management trades where you're looking for three or four R targets. If you're trying to get in and out, in and out, scalp, 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 maybe it's okay. But if you're trying to get two or three R and you're in the trade for 30 minutes or an hour, and you, which means you're going to be in three or four or five positions at one time, that could be a problem with capital constraints. It's an issue. Another capital constraint. Yep. I figured it all out to replace my salary. I need 150 grand a year. Okay. Well, your account might not be big enough to realistically do that. Maybe you have a $30,000 account. That means you need to make 500% per year. That's not terribly realistic. I mean, if you're risking two or 3%, that might be realistic, but not at half a percent or 1%. So you might be that person that has two problems, okay? The two problems you might have are, I want to take seven trades a day and I want to make 500%. Well, both of those are a problem. You probably don't have enough money in your account to take the seven trades a day you need. And you probably don't have enough money in your account to risk the amount of money you need to risk to make 500%. Now you have two problems. So all of these things factor in to whether or not you're going to likely be a successful trader. But most people don't even spend five seconds thinking through this. And then the personality trait one is, is usually the hardest one to overcome. Look, time's easy. Like that's just a math equation. I have a job at 11 o'clock. I need to leave the house by 1030. Great. That's easy. You have an hour to trade. Okay. It's pretty cut and dry. Capital. Oh, I got a 50K account. This is how much I... Pretty cut and dry. Personality and intangibles are a little bit more subjective. They need to become objective. Maybe, for example, you want to take those seven trades a day and you want to do it on a one minute chart. But maybe you're terrible with order entry. Maybe you're terrible with math. What I mean by that, you don't have enough time to figure out the stop, the entry, and the target quick enough to catch those one minute trades. That's an intangible that doesn't jive with what you're trying to become. So you might wanna move up to five minute charts to give yourself a little bit more time to develop the order entry or 15 minute charts. Do you see where all these factors come into play? People just th throw shit at the wall and hope it sticks. And they wonder why they're not doing well because they're not actually working towards being the trader they can be. They're working towards a trader they think they can be but it doesn't jive with their personality or their time or their capital or their intangibles. 
okay? It's a very big deal, and you need to really give it some serious thought when you're trading, okay? Let's move on a little bit, okay? Experienced traders might use a percentage of your account, but new traders use $5 risk. This is great, and a lot of you know this, but what happens when you do progress and you do move to 50 or 100 or 500 hours? Will your account be big enough to sustain that level of risk with the style you're currently using? Because one of the things you don't want to have to do is change your style later on. And I say this, you guys know where I'm going with this. Sometimes a trader will say, yeah, well, it's only $5 risk. I'll say to them, well, geez, that stock's very illiquid. It only does you know, 200,000 shares per day. Yeah, but I'm only trading $5 risk. It doesn't matter. Well, what if you're on $5 risk for six months and then you move to 10, then 20, and all of a sudden it's been two years and you're so used to trading 200,000 share stocks, but now you're doing $300 risk. You can't trade those stocks anymore. They're too spready, they're too whippy, they're too illiquid. But you've, been, you've taught yourself to trade illiquid stocks for two years. Start how you wanna be later on. Does that make sense? Trade liquid stocks from day one. Don't trade those crazy spready stocks. Get in the habit of doing the things you're supposed to be doing now so that later on, you don't have to make any other adjustments. It's hard enough, this business. You don't wanna to have to make these adjustments all the time, right? New traders, spend a couple weeks on paper, go to small risk, all right? Work your way up. Why do we work our way up? I know it sounds so stupid and obvious. We work our way up for two reasons. One, so you don't lose money unnecessarily, right? That's the number one reason. I would tell the same thing to Jeff Bezos. Start small. Two, you're learning so much about yourself during this process, and guess what? It's cheap. The education is cheap. If you risk too much money, the education could be very, very, very expensive, and a lot of you have found that out the hard way, okay? Frequency, some trades may be successful, but only happen very rarely, right? You can overcome smaller risk levels with higher frequency. Where am I going with this? This goes back to what type of trader do you want to be? For example, I'll look at Ollie. Ollie doesn't take that many trades. We've you know, done a good job here. After mentorship, he's increased frequency a little bit, but probably not exactly where you want to be yet. So for example, if you take one trade a day, 20 trades a month, well, let's roll it back. Okay, Jared, I am, this is the trader I want to be. I want to be a trader who averages 20 R a month. I'll give myself one month of year vacation, so I need 220 R a year. Okay, well, how many trades do you take? Oh, one trade a day. So you're going to take 220 trades and you want 220 R. You want basically a 1.0 expectancy. You're basically God. Yes, you're basically the Wilt Chamberlain of trading. You're the Wayne Gretzky of trading. No, to, to go into this business with that level of expectation is absurd. And it's a recipe for failure. And then why, that's why the, one of those slides, a couple slides ago, this is the reason most traders fail. Let's go back real quick. Let's go back. Trading is about the search for truth. Objective, personal truth. Well. To know that you need to be the Wilt Chamberlain, the Michael Jordan, Wayne Gretzky of trading is not a, a realistic goal. You might become that, but to start off with that is craziness. Don't you want to be able to make some mistakes and still hit your goal? Yes, the answer is yes, because we know we're not perfect. But if you want to make 220 R a year on 20 trades a month, good luck is all I have to say. That's not realistic. So you need to figure something out. You either need to say, okay, you know what? It's not about the R, Jared. I need to make $220,000 a year. Well, now we can work with that because now we can say, all right, well, maybe on 20 trades a month, we can get you to a risk level that's acceptable enough to hit that target with a lower accuracy, right? A lower batting average, a lower sharp or win-loss ratio, right? So now maybe, maybe, just hypotheticals, guys, maybe you only need to win maybe seven R a month, maybe you only need seven R a month. Well, that's okay, that's a 0 0.33 expectancy. Well, get your risk level to $3,000 and boom, now you're hitting your $220,000 goal. I'm not saying you're starting there, but now you have a realistic, reasonable path to that goal. 
But now we have to go and wind it back. Do you have an account large enough to risk $3,000? Now remember, you're not there yet, but someday you want to be there. Is your account large enough to do that? No, it's not. Okay, well now we have to go back to the drawing board again. Okay, how do I make $220,000 in two hours a day managing on two RL or nothing with one trade a day? Oh shit. Well, you come and you're like, one plus one doesn't equal two anymore. So something objectively has to change. You either need more trades or higher risk, but we know you can't do higher risk because you already said you don't have an account big enough. So now we need a higher frequency. Can you go from 20 trades a month to 30 or 40? Do you see where I'm going with all of this, guys? Now, I consider it to be obvious because I've been doing this 20 years, but to a new person, they're not thinking about any of this stuff. How do you get from where you are to where you want to be? And is it reasonable? I don't mean perfect. No one's perfect. So accept the fact, allow for the fact that you will make mistakes. Can you still hit those goals? Go back again to the slide. All right, I want $220,000 a year. All right, do I have the capital to do it? I don't know. Do I have the time to do it? I don't know. Do I have the personality to hold for two or three hours? I don't know. Then you got to check off all those things and you got to kind of reverse engineer it and go, I know what I want, but what I want doesn't coincide with what I actually am and what I have. I don't have the money for it. I don't have the time for it. And I don't have the personality for it. All right, well, let's tweak our goal till we get our goal and our money and our time and our personality to all match. And we all sing Kumbaya. Okay. And the other thing next, we're not even talking about experience yet. We're talking about down the road, right? Down the road, not even today. Okay. So once traders are beyond the point of discipline problems, larger risk amounts are less dangerous. And then you can start looking at, you can overcome smaller risk levels with higher frequency. You can reverse that. You can overcome lower frequency with higher risk levels, but that's down the road. Okay. It's like any business, right? If your restaurant only has 10 tables, you're not going to have 25,000 revenue. That's right. Unless it's the finest restaurant in the world and it's a thousand dollar a table, right? Where it's $500 a head, but you're right, Ollie, unless you're in that fine dining experience, Nobu or something like that, or what is that? Jiro in Japan or whatever, you're not getting there. So now you have to rework. You have to rework something. You either have to add more tables to the restaurant or increase prices on the menu or both. And then, or work backwards, open a second location. Simple math, right? So anyway, do not make our unit decisions during the trading day. This is kind of a little off topic from what I was talking about. Uh, there's no such thing as a great play beyond how great is defined in your plan. No one trade is no better than another trade. It's not, okay? The idiot always thinks things are great in the heat of the battle, okay? Oh, that's a great idea. I need to take it. Let's take a step back, okay? Now, guys. Duh, PTS. There are lots and lots and lots and lots of different ways to get to the same goal. Now, patterns have different expectations is the main point of this slide. This slide isn't about what a pattern is. Here's a buy setup. Here's a wedge. Here's a turnaround bar. Here's a breakout. Here's the three row. It's not about that. It's understanding the expectation. Guys, what's the expectation on a breakout? What type, one word answer, what type of pattern is a breakout? What type of pattern is this? Thank you, Brian. It's a momentum pattern. It's a momentum play. Okay, now, why am I asking this question? Because if you're somebody, for example, that has no patience whatsoever, then a wedge pattern or a buy setup might not be the best pattern for you because it's very common for a buy setup to trigger, chop around, and eventually work its way to your target. Breakouts, good ones, don't do that. It's possible that that happens, but that's not the modus operandi of a good breakout. So what's the whole purpose here? Well, if you're that jittery person, I'd stay away from buy setups. 
I'd stick with those three bar plays and those breakouts, right? Because you're the type of person who personality wise is probably not going to do so well on a big, on a big pullback, right? You go, Oh my gosh, Oh my gosh, Oh my gosh, it's going against me. What am I going to do? Right? That's your personality. So pick a pattern, pick a play that doesn't have that, that frequently doesn't have that. It should be a hit and run trade. Get to that target quickly. Okay. So understand the type of pattern that you're taking. Climactics, we know that oftentimes they take two entries. Are you willing to get back into a trade after you stopped out? If you are, then maybe a climactic is for you. Climactics are wild and whippy. Are you okay with that? And then hold on, we're not done. What if you're okay with that on $50 risk, but $5,000 risk scares you? Okay, hold on. We got to wind it back now. Remember we talked about personality traits, time constraints, all those types of things, frequency. Well, now you have a problem. Now you've been trading climactics for a long time and you feel comfortable until a certain, list, a certain risk level happens. Now you're like, yeah, that pattern scares the bejeebies out of me because I know what slippage is like on a $100 risk. Imagine what it's like on a $1,000 risk or $10,000 risk. I don't know if I want to take climactics anymore because they're so wild and whippy. I was okay with it at 100, but now, oh my gosh, I took one, I took a half hour slippage on it. Do you want to have to go back and recreate how you trade after three years or two years? Probably not. So know that if you choose to trade parabolics and climactics, that this is a wild and whippy pattern. And you know someday you, the goal is to get your risk from five dollars to five or ten thousand. That's the goal. Understand. I know. I know. You could be objective or subjectively saying, "Yeah, but I'll be ready by then." That's what most people will say. But I'll be ready by then, and maybe you will, maybe you won't. Only time will tell, right? But these are things you need to consider: the level of slippage you could take on parabolics, the sheer infrequency of parabolics. They just don't happen that often. So if you choose that pattern, you have to understand that your frequency is going to be low and it's going to be wild and whippy when you do take them. Understand the expectation because every pattern is different. And how does that meld or mold into your personality and your time and all of those things, okay? There's just a lot of things to consider when you trade and most people just don't. They're like, yep, gonna be a trader, threw some money into an account. YOLO! I wish I were joking, but it's extremely common, okay? You do, Martin, but let me give you an example. You're correct, 100% correct. You have to condition yourself to that level. But, as we talked about before the lecture, remember right before the lecture we talked about ten dollars and $20,000 risk? Certain patterns are more challenging. It's hard to get those kind of shares on a breakout, right? Because when it breaks over this level, they usually rip well, you're gonna to have to start anticipating more and more and more and lower and lower and lower getting into them because you're not gonna get filled over that number, right? Same with a parabolic. It's much easier on a buy setup, right? They don't explode like parabolics or, or breakouts. You see what I'm saying? So while yes, you're correct, we all need to condition ourselves to get to that level. There are some patterns that are more and less conducive to certain levels of risk. And on that note also, I'm gonna use Cliff and I think he won't mind me using him. Cliff is a, one of the best traders you'll ever meet. The guy reels off 200 R a year like it's clockwork, chilling out, okay? But he did $500 risk for shit, five or 10 years? I don't know, a long time. Why? He wasn't ready. For whatever reason, conservative nature with his, his money management approach, whatever it was, he just wasn't ready. Okay, and it took him a long time to get over it, and he finally did. Now he's at fifteen hundred dollar risk, and he's killing it. And I look at it and go, "Man, should have been doing that sooner." But he looks at it and says, "I wasn't ready." See, he was objective about it. Now, were there things he he maybe he could have done to push the readiness, right? Expand his paradigm, maybe, maybe. But who am I to tell him? He's a great trader. I can't tell him you're ready. You know, he finally got to that point. He finally got to that point. And now it's my goodness, 
best month he's ever had in 15, 20 years of trading. He just had it last month. I'm not surprised. Why am I not surprised? Because he's the same trader he was two months ago, three months ago. So it should carry over to the higher risk level. It was just a question of would he break his plan? And for me, there was no question there because Cliff doesn't ever break his plan or almost never breaks his plan. So to me, making the more money was just a byproduct of higher risk because Cliff, in my mind, has always been capable of it. And now, the world is his oyster. He, you know, Jeff Yates always says, once you expand your mind, it can never retain its original shape. Cliff's mind will never retain its original shape. And I bet you guys, going from 1,500 to 2,000 will be quicker than it was from 500 to 1,500 because I think he's seeing that. You know, we'll see. Time will tell. But he's a machine. But he was objective about saying, I'm not ready. Now, here's a few examples from recent, okay? There's a method to my madness here, all right? Roku. One minute breakdown with relative weakness made three grand on this trade, okay? This wasn't, I don't know, a month or two ago, something like that. Nice pattern, right? Breakdown, entry 90, 65, stop loss 92. But this isn't what this is about. Sure, you can look at this and go, wow, the market turned weak and Roku went lower and I made money. Great, great, great. Who gives a shit? Who cares? The question is simple. Selling at half, selling half at half R, that's a scalper's approach. That's what I did. I sold half of my position at a half of an R gain. Okay? You can see it right down here. You can see my order right there at 90.04. All right? I'm in this thing roughly a 90.65. That's a 60 cent gain roughly on a $1.30 stop. $1.35 stop. So roughly a 60 cent gain. Okay, 65 cent gain, whatever. That's a half of an R. Is that a reasonable approach to trading? I don't know. Is it? And the answer on every one of these, and I'm going to give it to you early, is it depends. It depends on your personality traits, your time constraints, your capital constraints, your intangibles. What are you really good at? For most people, for many people, selling half of a half of an R is a very difficult approach to trading. Why? Simple. Because they don't win often enough to overcome such a small target. They simply do not win often enough to overcome such a small target. Okay, let's try it again. Selling all of it for a half R gain. Stupid. Is this little Forrest Gump action here? Our half R target's insane. Entry, 42.55. Stop loss, 41.80. Nice little shakeout tail in UAL. You can see my order, 42.55 right there. 7,000 shares of this thing right here. Okay, it's moving on up, moving on up, moving on up. The order is set in the system to sell at 42.91, which is a half hour gain. All right, that's what, a 36 cent target or something like that? On a 72 cent stop? Is that nuts? Is it crazy? I don't know, you guys tell me. Is it crazy? It depends. Can you win enough to offset when you lose? Next, can you handle, while it may be rare and unusual, can you handle taking a full loss knowing that you need two trades to get back to break even? Can you handle that? I mean, this bat's like 80%, but on that 10 or 20%, where you stop out. Imagine, imagine you had back-to-back -back stop outs. Now you need four winning trades to get back to break even. Can you handle that? Made me a lot of money in January. I was doing a half R all or nothing. That's it. Half R all or nothing. Made me a lot of money in January. I mean, I wish I was doing two R because that made even more money, okay? Exactly, Ollie. What does the back testing say? What does your personality say? What does your time constraints say? We're looking at every factor in here. We're putting all of those things together and we're still going to back test it and we're going to try to find, wait for it, objective truth. 
That's what we're looking for. I don't want subjectivity. I want to know the, the actual truth. I don't tell, don't tell me what you think. Show me what the numbers say. Okay? Tesla. Two minute, three bar play. Pretty nice pattern. $5,000 gain on Tesla. R1, R target's insane. You guys see where I'm going with this. I'm slowly moving in a direction. Slowly. Selling for 1R. 1R all or nothing. Is that nutso? Is that crazy? I don't know. What do the stats say? What does your personality say? What does your time constraints say? What does your tracking spreadsheet tell you? How do you feel when you're doing it? I don't know. I'm not you. I'm not you. Okay? Right. The, you know, the comment that somebody's making is it works as long as your batting average is high enough. That's true. But, Antoine, can you have a high, high enough batting average? That's the question. It's a $64,000 question. Can you have a high enough batting average? Are you a good enough stock picker to make 1R work? Goes back to, again, what's the objective truth? What are the stats telling you? Okay. So there's a 5K gain there. Great. Keeps keep going. Snow from, was this yesterday? Yes, it was yesterday. Is a hybrid approach insane? This was a very nice pattern. 173, you know, a three minute four bar play. I mean, it's just a beautiful pattern. Okay, I don't know why this is... Stop loss is so off there. I apologize. The stop loss is actually right here. So my apologies there. But nonetheless, not the point. Okay. I got a late fill. This stock did eventually work. And this thing went down to like 166. Just kept on going and going and going. Okay. That hybrid approach in this case was half at 1R, half at 2R. Half at 1R, sell, move to break even on the stop loss, sell the back half a 2R. Is that insane? I don't know. What do the statistics say? Okay. Next, next. What about this? Meta two minute buy setup, gave it extra room. I gave this trade a lot of room due to market conditions and almost stopped. It held 481 by 22, then end of the day, not at target, but still up 3,200. What's the question I'm gonna ask? question I'm going to ask is this. Are you prepared to hold a trade all day? I did. Are you comfortable waiting three to four hours for a target? It goes back to the time constraints. Do you have a management that you can literally place a bracket order, set it and walk away from? If not, then that management approach doesn't meet your time constraints. This buy setup literally lasted all day. I exited at 3.45 p.m. Do you have that kind of time? I set a bracket and walked away, right? I did. I set a bracket and walked away, okay? Yeah, comfortable with it, but don't like it. They're two different things. As long as you're not breaking your plan, right, Brandon? That's all that matters. But some people, let's be honest. Look, come on, guys. Let's talk like adults for a second. You know you've done this before. You set your bracket order and you go and you leave for work and what do you do? You pull out this little device called a, an iPhone, cell phone, and you're looking at it, you're looking at it, you're looking at it, oh my gosh, well, you're supposed to be at work right now, you're supposed to be doing other things. Yes, exactly right, Sophia, exactly. They stress about it. They're out there having lunch with their kids and they're, they're literally, instead of enjoying the moment with their family, they're thinking about the stock and trade that they're in. You don't want to do that. So you need to understand personality-wise, can you handle that? Or you might have a rule by, I don't know, say 11 o'clock. If it doesn't hit target by 11 o'clock, I hit market and walk away. Maybe. Okay, now let's take it one last step further, one more. How would you react, okay, if your trade hit target but didn't fill you, then what's your reaction? Printed 300 shares, none of which were mine. Then what is your reaction? What's your reaction? 
Can you handle that? Are you going to explode? You, all of these things, again, to be fair, are things you might not fully objectively know until you've experienced them, okay? Until they happen to you. Like I always use the, in the chat room, I said nobody cares until it comes knocking on your door, right? Well, what happens when a stock goes right to the penny, at the penny, on the penny, and then boom, doesn't fill you? Exactly, punch the monitor, throw the mouse. Cry, that's okay, you're not destroying anything. You got to figure out, how can I mitigate this? If you're that person, maybe set a bracket and literally walk away and don't watch it, don't look at it, okay? Yeah, mad for a second, then indifference happens. I'm mad for more than a second, but that's 5,000 bucks. Right? I'm mad for more than a second, but you have to cope and understand. Maybe my risk is too high, or maybe this approach isn't for me. So, the key is this. Know thyself. Having a trading plan that is conducive to your personality style is crucial. Do not ignore it. Most traders chase money without ever giving thought to personal. Here, let's, let's just put this in freaking pink. Let's do this, let's underline it, let's italicize it. Let's read it out loud together. Most traders chase money without ever giving thought to personal strengths and weaknesses. It's possibly the single biggest reason traders fail. Lack of a trading plan that fits them. And that's the key part. Not lack of a plan, lack of a plan that fits them. Okay, important points, track all your trades. Make sure to have a column that includes actual results versus trading plan results. Try not to adjust your plan too often. Those little increments are fine, adjustments are fine. One bad month of trading does not equal a bad trading plan. And a lot of people feel like they do. I've seen a lot of traders, Jared, I lost 6R last month, I have a bad plan. Well, one, did you follow the bad plan? Okay, and it may not be a bad plan, right? Trading plans only work when they're consistently followed over long periods of time. We're odds traders, so let the odds play out in your favor, trust the plan. And Ollie tells you guys all the time, variation is a process killer. Variation is a process killer. You keep changing a little or almost following your plan here and there, eh, it's kind of hard to know what's really actually happening, okay? Considerations. Realistic time it will take to succeed is one to three years. Plan for it. Plan for it, okay? Don't think you're better or more prepared because of prior success. You're not. You're not. Some things might present themselves, like Ali, for example, is very analytical and he's put together some, men, some really wonderful spreadsheets. So that has helped him, but he still had to learn who he was as a trader. Was he an objective person? He knows now, for example, that he is very, very precise with his approach to the point where he doesn't take enough trades sometimes. He's working on that and doing a great job. He's increased his frequency and it's helped him. But my point is, is we still have to go through things, experience things to know things. Okay, we think something, but until we experience it, we won't know how we actually react to it. Okay, profitability will come slowly and at a small level in the beginning, right? Therefore, have a secondary source of income, part-time job, all of those things to what? Take the stress away from needing to make money as a trader, especially when you're new. Eventually, you'll become like a robot. It'll just be automatic. But those first couple few years, you don't want that kind of stress. The business is stressful enough, okay? And this is one I don't think people spend enough time. Expect to make mistakes. I know people go, Jared, that's a, that's a negative attitude. It is not a negative attitude expecting to make mistakes yes it's going to happen i to my knowledge to my knowledge i don't believe tom brady has ever had a game where he's had a perfect game and i don't mean a perfect passer rating i mean a perfect game where he was 30 for 30 throwing the football i don't think it's ever happened what does that mean there's a few mistakes whether it's a teammate's mistake or his mistake mistakes were made they did a lot of great things but you, you're going to make some mistakes for me today, I had a down day today, but I had 15 of 16 up days, 10 days in a row up. I'm going to have a down day. I'm going to make a mistake or take a trade that doesn't work. Oh, well, 
should I all be all depressed today? No. I should be like, hey, reversion to the mean. That's it, right? Inconsistent will be normal in the beginning. Our goal is to fix that and become consistent. Feeling the roller coaster will be normal in the beginning. Tell me I'm wrong. You guys have had days where you had the best weekend ever because Friday was a great trading day. You had the worst weekend ever because tr Friday was a minus three hour down day and you, it literally ruined your whole weekend. You get to a point where it just doesn't matter. By the time you close your platform down on Friday, good day, bad day, the weekend's totally separate. But when you're new, but when you're new, two bad days, Thursday, Friday, or just Friday could ruin your whole weekend. That's a novice approach, okay? Understand what's required. Hard work, dedication, persistence, continual education combined with market experience. Anything less just won't be good enough. Guys, strive for, per, for uh, perfection. Cliff has a, a great blog post that you guys want to check out there. Exactly, Brandon. You say, don't get that way anymore. But you did. And I did when I started. I was like a little freaking roller coaster. Okay? You guys have seen this slide before too. Plan for success, not failure. The more objectively and accurately you define yourself as an individual and build your trading style around it, the more successful you'll be. And that's the key. Build your plan around who you are objectively, not who you think you are subjectively, okay? Remember, outcome goals without process goals are just pipe dreams. That, I use the same analogy every time I, I, I do this, okay? It's the Lamborghini on the wall with no job. It's the Lamborghini on the wall with no process to own it. She's like, yeah, I think I want that someday. Well, how are you going to make that happen? It's like the retirement conversation we had yesterday, professional wealth building strategies. You want to retire at 40 or 50 or 60. Great. How are you going to, what is the process that you will need to go through to have enough money by that age so that you can retire? Nobody ever thinks about it. They just wake up and go, I hope one day I'll have enough to retire. Well, hope is not a strategy. Put it on paper. Trading is no different. So key points, available time, your personality style, your financial resources, and your personal preferences. Okay, and again, last slide. Trading is about the search for truth. Objective, personal truth. Rid yourself of subjective bias, find objective truth. You will have to go through some subjectivity to get to objectivity, right? You believe a certain way until you're proven it's not that way. So your tracking spreadsheet tells you, no, that's just not true. Now you have a new reality. The question is, will you accept the new reality? Because if you don't accept the new reality, you can't change it. Does this make sense? If you're subjective and then you see something, you're like, wait, wait, that's, that's not what I thought it was. But if you're still in the denial phase, you're not going to be able to change it. And that change is the progress needed to become a successful trader, okay? We all have to go through this. Every one of us, none of us are immune to this. Every one of us has had a, a, a moment in life where we're like, well, shit, I didn't know that. Or I thought that was true, but I was just flat wrong. It's okay. There's nothing wrong with it. In fact, it's a good thing. It shows progress. The fact that you're willing to say, I was wrong is progress. And now we can make meaningful change to help become a better trader, more successful, more profitable, hopefully, right? So this is what it's really all about, the search for personal truth. And it has to have some level of objectivity. And the way to get there is to track your trades, videotape yourself trading, take notes, go back and rewatch it. Take notes on it. Have other people watch it. Talk to an accountability partner. Get a trading buddy. Do all of those things so they can say, hey, look, I know you thought this was good, but let's review it. Let's talk about why you feel that way and how you got to that decision to take that buy setup that really wasn't a buy setup. How did you come to that decision? Let's talk about it so that next time when you're in the same position, you'll think differently. And then by doing so, you'll be a little bit more objective. So I hope that makes sense to you guys. It's a very deep topic, but a simple one at the same time. 
right? There's a lot of introspection that takes place, but the broad concept is simple. We need to be better at our process so that our outcome goals will be greater. All right. So hope you guys learned enough to become better traders. I hope this lecture will help you guys be more profitable. I'm Jared Wesley of Live Traders. We'll get back at it again next week.